Hey there. This video is gonna be a deep dive into comparing the Canon R6 Mark II and the Sony a7 IV. And I think people are gonna be making this comparison for a long time because <laughs> there are a lot of similarities between these two cameras, but there are also some differences. So let me start off by talking about why I'm making this comparison. Well, first of all, both of these cameras are the same price. They're currently selling for $2,500 in the US. And I know a lot of us like to talk about Canon versus Sony, but until recently it's been hard because they don't really have models that line up and are really comparable with each other. I think the most recent one is gonna be the Sony a7R5 being fairly similar to the Canon R5, but these two cameras are very, very similar. <laughs> and I think a lot of the decisions that were made into what was gonna be put into the R6 Mark II were basically to compete with the a7 IV or to try to beat it. Now at this price point of $2,500, it's interesting to me because I kind of call this a prosumer camera. It is priced and has the specs that it'll satisfy a lot of you know, high-end hobbyists and consumers, but also it will reach out to a lot of professionals and you can use this in a lot of different situations. It is a, the, both these cameras are very well-rounded hybrid prosumer cameras that can be used both at a very high level for photo and video. So the quick answer is there's no easy decision between these two cameras, but everyone has different needs and I guarantee you as you watch this, you'll figure out which camera is better for you. So we'll kick it off by talking about the image quality. Now, both of these cameras have awesome image quality. Taking these out and shooting in the real world, I have really no complaints about the image out of both of these cameras. They both are detailed, sharp, and have awesome color. And both of them grade really easily, both in S-Log3 and C-Log3. They're very pleasant cameras to shoot with because they just look really good and produce a really nice image. I have no complaints, as I said, about the overall image quality between these two cameras. But let's do some pixel peeping because that's what we like to do on, the, on this channel and get kind of nerdy. So first of all, we'll take a look at 4K24. And the main differences here are that the a7 IV has a 7K uh, oversampled 4K and the Canon R6 Mark II has a 6K oversampled 4K, but they're both full frame. So taking a look here at comparing these two cameras in 4K24, you will see that the a7 IV is slightly sharper and has slightly less noise. I did a deep dive comparison into all this stuff in a low light comparison video, which I'll leave linked down below with other videos that uh, are deeper dives into all these tests that I'll be showing you throughout this video. Now let's get on talking about slow motion. And one of the biggest complaints about the a7 IV when it was released and in the past year is the fact that if you shoot in 4K60 on the a7 IV, it applies a 1.5 times APS-C crop. There's no way to shoot full frame 4K60 on the a7 IV. Now, that is one of the biggest selling points of the R6 Mark II is that we'll shoot a full frame 6K oversampled 4K60. Now, what's interesting is that on the a7 IV, if you shoot in 4K60, like I said, it has that 1.5 times APS-C crop, but it is a 4.6K oversample. Now, both of these produce a really nice image and very smooth footage and the autofocus works great. So let's take a look here at some pixel peeping and take a closer look. Now comparing these two, this a7 IV looks sharper here and has slightly less noise. And this is a little confusing to me, but the results are what they are because the a7 IV is a 4.6K oversampled crop mode versus a 6K oversampled full frame, but the results are what they are. And I'd say that the a7 IV, as I said, looks sharper and has less noise in its 4K60 crop mode versus the full frame 4K60 on the R6 Mark II. So next let's compare the 4K60 crop mode on the R6 Mark II with the 4K60 crop mode on the a7 IV. And the 4K60 crop mode on the R6 Mark II is a one-to-one -one readout. So taking a look here, you'll see that the a7 IV looks sharper, which is no surprise because it was sharper against the full frame mode in the, four, in the R6 Mark II, but it also is less noisy, which definitely makes sense too, because when you crop in on a sensor, you're using a smaller sensor and you're increasing the noise. Now, these cameras both shoot in 120 frames per second in 1080p, so I wanna take a look at both of those. And you know, just looking at the footage, they do look pretty good. There's no crop, it is a full width. But diving in and taking a look at the image closer up, you see that the a7 IV is way better in terms of sharpness and noise. It's not even close. Now also the R6 Mark II has something up its sleeve. It can shoot in 1080p, 180 frames per second, which the um, a7 IV does not. So taking a look and comparing the 120 versus 180, you would say that the image quality is very similar between the two of them. Uh, I don't really see much of a difference. One thing to keep in mind with the 120 frames per second on the R6 Mark II is that you have to shoot in the high frame rate mode and it automatically spits out 30 frames a second and you can't change that. 
Not that big of a deal. You can slow it down to 80% if you're shooting in, if your timeline is in 24 frames a second, but I wanted to point that out. Another thing is I noticed when I was testing the 120 versus 180 in the R6 Mark II was the autofocus didn't do as well in the 180 frames per second and then the 120 frames per second. Now let's talk about dynamic range. And this is a big difference between these two cameras. So if you'd like to see a detailed breakdown of the dynamic range between these two cameras and the Canon R7, I made a video about that, which I'll leave linked down below. So in these tests here, we're shooting in S-Log3 in the A7 IV and C-Log3 in the R6 Mark II. And there's a lot of differences just between those two log curves. And I did have like a little bit of a rant in that other video if you wanna see that. But I am really frustrated the fact that the R6 Mark II doesn't have C-Log2, but that's for another time. But there's a big difference in dynamic range here, which you'll see. So first of all, taking a look at the overexposure test, and this is where I overexpose the image and then try to see how much information I can recover in the highlights. These two cameras were good till about four stops over and the image started to fall apart at five stops. So in terms of the overexposure test, these cameras perform very similar in the highlights. And next, getting onto the underexposure test, this is where we see a big difference. So as I underexpose the image and try to recover information in the shadows here, you'll see that the A7 IV has way less noise, it's much cleaner, and the R6 II gets messy a lot quicker and has a color shift. I'd say the A7 IV does extremely well, good down to about, so about four stops under and holds the color really well. It does get a little bit noisy, but four stops under is a lot. I wouldn't necessarily go that far down into the shadows to pull out information, but you can definitely see the difference in the dynamic range. And to back this up here, you can see this example of me standing next to a window, next to a curtain. And you'll see here, the easiest place to see this is if you look at the curtain, you will see that the a7 IV is much cleaner and has a lot more detail. There's a huge difference in dynamic range between these two cameras. And I think a lot of it, as I said, has to do with the fact that you cannot shoot in C-Log2 on the R6 Mark II. Now, this camera should be able to record 6K RAW externally, and I couldn't test that yet because the firmware is not available yet on the Atomos Ninja V and V Plus. I actually emailed Atomos to ask them about that, so when that is available, I will test it out, but as of right now, recording internally, the a7 IV has a lot more dynamic range than the R6 Mark II. Now let's get to talking about the high ISO or low light performance of these two cameras, and I made a detailed video comparing these cameras with the Canon R7. So if you're interested in more details, I'll leave that video linked down below as well. So as we saw at ISO 800 and 4K24, the a7 IV is cleaner than the R6 Mark II. So as you look through the ISO range here, you'll see that the a7 IV is cleaner in a lot of the different ISOs here. 3200, they both clean up a little bit more, but it's a little bit more obvious with the R6 Mark II. And from 3200 to uh, 5000, I'd say the a7 IV is slightly cleaner. From 6400 up to 10,000, I think they look pretty similar. And then when you hit 12,800 and up, I'd say the noise kind of looks different. It's a little bit of a personal preference. I think to me, the R6 Mark II looks a little bit better, but this might be due to noise reduction. So not really sure. I'd say they both do really, really well in the mid to high ISO range. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that both of these have, I'm gonna call this an informal second base ISO or second base sensitivity of these sensors. And they both occur at 3200. So taking a look here, when you go from 2500 to 3200, you can see that both of these images clean up quite a bit. I think it's a little bit more obvious with the R6 Mark II, but that might be the fact that it is a little bit noisier in those lower ISO ranges. Now let's talk about IBIS or in-body image stabilization. So both of these cameras have an in-body image stabilization system. So for these comparisons, I had the RF 24-70 f2.8, and for the Sony, I had the 24-70 G Master Mark II. So it's a little bit unfair here because the RF lens has stabilization built in, but those are comparable lenses, and Sony has not been putting stabilization in a lot of their modern releases, so those are my comparable lenses here. Now, in the Canon camera, you can't turn the lens stabilization off and still have IBIS on. They're either both on or both off. So that's what we have to roll with. And that's how these cameras work because those are the lenses that are you know, comparable here. So that's what we're gonna take a look at. So the first example here is gonna be me doing sort of a walking vlogging test at 24 millimeters, just kind of walking, kind of normally just holding the camera by the lens. And so if you take a look here, the R6 Mark II is using the lens and body stabilization, whereas the a7 IV is using the body stabilization, which is the standard stabilization. So I'd say that the R6 Mark II definitely looks a lot better here than the A7 IV. Next, we'll get on to adding electronic stabilization on both. So we have lens and body stay plus electronic on the R6 Mark II. And we have the active stabilization, which is the body stabilization plus electronic on the 
A7 IV. And I'd say on this, on this comparison here, the A7 IV was much closer, but I still have to give a slight edge to the Canon R6 Mark II. So a lot of people are critical about the Canon's IBIS system on wide angle lenses. And if you are using it all the way open at like 15 millimeters, like if you're using an RF 15 to 35, you get those wobbles in the corners. And it's definitely true, they're still there on the R6 Mark II, but if you're looking for something that's not quite as wide, I'd say that the IBIS on the R6 Mark II definitely looked a little bit smoother when you're walking. Now taking a look at a static shot. So the first example here is just no stabilization and then comparing it again with the same combinations of just lens and body stave and body stave on the a7 IV and then adding electronic stabilization on both of those. And I have to say that they both work pretty similar in terms of getting a static shot. So if you're just trying to stand there and hold a static shot, I think both work really well. But in terms of the walking test, I would give that to the R6 Mark II, minus the wobbles, but that's because I think the stabilization is a little bit stronger. And also a lot of camera manufacturers have issues with super wide lenses with their stabilization systems. Another big complaint about the a7 IV is the fact that the rolling shutter performance is pretty bad. So taking a look here at the rolling shutter between these two cameras, I would definitely say the R6 Mark II performs better than the a7 IV. So if rolling shutter is important to you, then the R6 Mark II definitely performs better. Now I wanna talk about build quality and ergonomics. I don't wanna to get too far into this, but I just wanna mention a couple things. So both of these are great cameras to use. They have a nice deep grip, they're nice to hold, and you'll be happy with either, using either of these cameras. There's lots of buttons and dials all over it. There's mode dials, and there are three dials for exposure, which is great. Onto the back of the cameras, they do have a lot of customizable buttons. One thing I have to say about the Sony camera is that just Sony in general lets you assign more things to each button. There are limitations with that in the Canon camera. A couple small things to point out here are, you know, things like the camera strap. I wish that Sony implemented their own uh, system that they have on like the FX3 and the FX30, which is similar to what you see on the R7. I hate these flappy camera straps. <laughs> uh, they did eliminate the flappy bit a little bit just because they, uh, they added some tension on here. But in terms of the overall feel and build quality here, I personally prefer the Canon camera. I just like the texture and the way it feels, but I, there aren't really any big complaints about the a7 IV. So one thing I wanna complain about with the R6 Mark II is of course, we have a micro HDMI port, which I complain about all the time, but you do get a full size HDMI port on the a7 IV. So that is a big difference for me in terms of memory cards. The R6 Mark II shoots to two SD cards, whereas the A7 IV, you can either do two SD cards or two CF Express Type A cards, so a few more options there. But they both have flip screens, they both have EVFs. Uh, overall, uh, they both feel like solid full frame cameras, but in terms of just the overall feel of it, I'd probably give that to the R6 Mark II, but that's my personal preference. All right, so what's really the same between these two cameras? Well, first of all, like we were talking about before with image quality, they both shoot 4K 10-bit 422 up to 60 frames a second and 1080p up to 120 frames per second. There are no recording time limits on either, either of these cameras. You can also use the hot shoe to attach an XLR uh, module for plugging in microphones, so that's great. So either the XLR K3M on the a7 IV or the Tascam unit both work great. They both have focus breathing compensation, which is great to see. It's one of my favorite features that's come out in the last year. It was debuted in the a7 IV. They just added a bunch of new lenses that were compatible with the R6 Mark II. So again, if you wanna see a video about that, I made one down below if you wanna check that out. They also have USB streaming as a webcam feature. Uh, as I said, they have that similar hybrid body design with flippy screen and an EVF. So again, very usable and very similar between them. They both have an APS-C crop mode for both photo and video, which is super handy because they're a little bit higher megapixel you can crop in, which is really handy and something I really missed having, you know, shooting on something like the A7S III or the FX3. Being able to crop in gives you a lot extra reach on whatever lens you're shooting on. Uh, the EVFs are very, very similar. So the they both have a half inch EVF with the R6 Mark II being a 3.69 million dot and a 3.68 million dot. So EVFs are very, very similar. Now let's talk about what's different between these two cameras. So the R6 Mark II has a 24.2 megapixel full frame sensor, whereas the a7 IV has a 33 megapixel full frame sensor. So we saw the differences in terms of image quality when shooting in 4K and in 4K 60 and 1080p 120. But if you're doing photography, most people will probably choose the a7 IV because you have more megapixels and more ability to crop in post. In terms of the codecs when you're recording, there are a lot more options with the a7 IV. The R6 Mark II will only shoot in IPB and IPB light, whereas in the a7 IV, you can shoot in IPB, which is the XAVC 
S codec, but you also have the all I X ABC SI codec and the HS codec, which is a H.265 highly compressed codec. So a lot more options there. As I mentioned earlier, you will be able to shoot 6K uh, ProRes RAW recording externally to a Ninja V when that um, feature comes out on the new firmware for the Atomos recorders, but I couldn't test it as of now. But the A7IV does not do any external RAW recording, so that is a little bit of a difference. So again, we'll see what the quality looks like when we're able to do that. Now, in terms of autofocus modes, it's a little bit different. There's a few more options in the R6 Mark II in terms of different subjects, but it also has an auto subject detection, which is really cool, uh, and it allows you to automatically or let the camera automatically choose between the different subjects. So that's kind of neat. In terms of overheating, uh, this is a little bit of a difference. So the R6 Mark II, Canon says, will not overheat in 4K24. And I tested that and it doesn't. And even when I tested it in 4K60 and got it to overheat, when I flipped it over to 4K24 immediately and started running it, the heat measurement on the screen started going down. So I don't think this camera will overheat in 4K24. Whereas the A7 IV has overheated on me three times in 4K24. And when I made that uh, video a while ago talking about that, or maybe a few videos where I mentioned it, I got a lot of pushback because not a lot of people had it overheat, but you can get this camera to overheat in 4K24. So if you're shooting long record times or out in the heat, things like that, you can get this to overheat in 4K24, but both these cameras will overheat in long run times in 4K60. A lot of people never have this camera overheat, but it is a possibility, so I wanted to let you know. So these cameras both have flippy screens, like I said before, which is great for filming yourself and different angles and stuff like that, but there is quite a big difference in terms of the quality of the screen. So they both are three inch LCDs, but the R6 Mark II has a 1.62 million dot screen versus a 1.04 million dot screen on the a7 IV Plus. The screen on the R6 Mark II is brighter and more colorful and just much easier to judge exposure and overall image quality. So Sony has been giving new screens to their more recent releases, but if you're looking at in terms of the screens, the R6 Mark II is definitely nicer. Now, I don't really talk about photography much on this channel, but I do have to mention there's a big difference for photography in terms of burst rates. So the R6 Mark II can shoot 40 frames per second electronic and 12 frames per second mechanical, whereas the a7 IV can shoot 10 in both mechanical and electronic. So if photography is your thing and you want to have high burst rates, the R6 Mark II definitely has an advantage there. And one other thing I want to point out, it's a big difference is going to be the lens selection between the two systems. And lensing is an important thing to just consider if you are just trying to decide which camera to go with, like if you don't have any lenses already, because there are a lot more options, not just from Sony, but a lot of third party options available that are native to the Sony system in terms of different price brackets, um, focal lengths, apertures. There's a lot of options. Now the R6 Mark II and the RF system, there are some really nice lenses from Canon. There's like some of their budget prime lenses and there are also some really expensive L series lenses, but there's nothing really in between. And you can adapt older EF lenses pretty easily, but if you're looking for native lenses, then the, you know, the, the Sony system is definitely gonna be a better bet. All right, so what do you get with the a7 IV that you don't get in the R6 Mark II? Well, first of all, I would say that you get, as I said before, that sharper image with less noise across the board. It's just a cleaner image when you take a look and you do some pixel beeping. But as I said, overall, if you're just looking at the image, I think both look great. You definitely get way more dynamic range in the a7 IV. It's not even close. You also get more codecs and bitrate options, like I was mentioning. You have the XAVC SI, S, and HS, and you also get more megapixels for photos. So what do you get with the R6 Mark II? Well, you get that uncropped 4K60, which I have to say is very helpful in a bunch of situations, especially if you're doing things like real estate and you wanna shoot 4K60, you don't have to use you know, wider APS-C lenses specifically for that on the a7 IV. You can get a very wide shot with a normal wide angle lens, like a 16 to 35. You also have less rolling shutter. You also have that 6K raw external recording when it becomes available. And I'd also say that the IBIS performs better on the R6 Mark II. So <laughs> like I said at the beginning of the video, there's no clear winner here. There are pros and cons of both cameras and hopefully you were taking notes throughout the video to try to determine which one's better for you. Currently, they're the same price in the US, so which one should you buy? Well, I think it really comes down to the camera systems and a lot of that has to do with the lenses. So for whatever work that you're doing, if you're doing real estate, if you're doing vlogging, if you're doing content creation, interviews, wildlife, whatever you're doing, Think about the lenses that you'll wanna use and that will help you determine which camera system that you're buying into. But generally people aren't buying their first camera, they probably already have a few lenses so it makes it a little bit harder to, to figure out. There are also brand preferences, maybe like the ergonomics, the menus, the way the cameras feel, maybe the color science is slightly different between the two cameras and you have a preference there. That's totally fine. Don't always go by the pixel peeping and the specs and all that stuff. Sometimes it's more important about how you interact with the camera and the images that actually are produced because 
looking at you know test charts and stuff is is important to understand the characteristics and the difference between these two cameras. But going on shooting with the cameras is also really important. Also keep in mind other cameras that you already own or if you're shooting with other people, what cameras they shoot with because it's really handy when you're matching footage when you have the same brand because the color sense will be similar and you can also share lenses. So a lot to consider. I think both of these cameras are gonna make a lot of people happy and you really can't go wrong with either one. They're both really solid overall hybrid cameras doing really high professional level video and photo. So as I said, you can't really go wrong with either of these. And if you aren't already, hit subscribe. If you'd like to see how to set up these cameras for shooting video, I made videos about that. So check out these two videos here. Otherwise, thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.